In the ancient world, the length of sword blades has a relationship with the size of shields, how they're held, and indeed even the length of my arm. Hi folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiator. Now, before I blow anybody's minds by holding a Bronze Age sword with a Viking period shield, don't worry, this is going to be discussing both of those things, the Viking era, but also the, uh, the Bronze Age as well. And how, when we're looking at the ancient and early medieval world, when we're looking at the development of swords and the development of shields and the way that they're held and used, they are inextricably connected. So before I go back into time to the Bronze Age, I am going to pick up a more appropriate sword for this shield which is a Viking era sword. Now this particular type of shield you will notice it is boss gripped. They actually come in a variety of sizes they go all the way up to about 95 even 100 centimeters across um, but they also go all the way down to about 55 to 65 centimeters as well. What am I basing this on? A whole bunch of archaeology so there's some very good books out there like the early Anglo-Saxon shield looking at the size of shields in Anglo-Saxon burials, but we also have lots of Viking shields as well, or at least Scandinavian Norse shields, um, from uh, various um, sunken ships where the shields have survived, and of course also burials in Scandinavia as well. We've also got famously Sutton Hoo. Now a lot of people when they think of Anglo-Saxon shields will first think of the Sutton Hoo shield, but the Sutton Hoo shield is, I think, in no way, shape or form a typical, uh, even early Anglo-Saxon shield because it is really, really big. It's about 95 centimetres if I remember correctly across. It's also probably somewhat convex. It's also got a rim around it, which is very unusual. And it, of course, it's got lots of gold and garnet fittings. So it's very, very high status and very particular shield. Actually, if we look at a lot of um, other early Anglo-Saxon shields, they actually seem to be smaller. And what's interesting is there is a parallel to be made there with the Bronze Age as well, but we'll come back to the Bronze Age in a second. Anyway, sticking in the Viking Age or Anglo-Saxon, Frankish period, whatever you want to call it. Um, so this kind of early medieval pre-Norman era um, or running up to the Norman era. So there is a relationship between the way that a shield is used and held and the length of blade. Now, you will notice that if you look at, uh, for example, Ian Pierce's book, Swords of the Viking Age, you will notice that there is some variation in the length of uh, Viking era and you know, Anglo-Saxon Frankish swords. They tend to vary. I'm going to switch from metric. I'm sorry to imperial. No, but that's, I'm British and that's how my brain works. Um, generally speaking, the blades tend to be between about 27 or 28 inches up to about 31 inches. Now, what's interesting, and this is an important point uh, to, to the purposes of this video, it is interesting that one-handed swords from across the world um, and across periods of history, uh, one-handed swords tend to be in this length range. And it's, of course, because we're humans. It doesn't matter whether you're in 18th century India or whether you're in, um, you know, medieval uh, kind of dark age Europe or whether you're indeed in the uh, in Iron Age period as well. The long bladed swords and we'll look at shorter bladed swords like the Bronze Age ones and also Roman gladii as well in a second. Uh, but these long bladed swords seem to have had a sort of optimum preferred length for a lot of people in a lot of places. Now, what's interesting is a lot of people in a lot of places using these length uh, swords were also using shields which were of, let's call them medium shape. But this does also relate to the use of bucklers as well. Now, it's an interesting thing. Whether you're holding a large shield that's boss gripped like this uh, out at arm's length or whether you're holding a buckler which kind of works by uh, providing a sort of cone of defence rather than a literal defence, it is held at arm's length. So funnily enough, regardless of whether it is a small buckler or a larger shield, and even a, a bigger one than this, it is restricted to how far away you can hold it from the body. Now, there's an interesting thing. Without stabbing myself, I'm going to try and illustrate this. If we go from my body to the end of a blade, oh, surprise, surprise. The sword blade is designed to be long enough to be able to hit someone when they've got an extended arm out here defending themselves with something. Now, what's funny is this actually doesn't particularly matter what the thing in the hand is. It could be, it could be a large shield, which obviously does project, project forward of the hand. Um, or it could be a small buckler which is held face forward like that. Um, or indeed it could be a left hand dagger, a cloak, whatever. But the fact is that fundamentally this length here, I believe, this is my, this is my belief, and I think certain other people share it, if not everybody, 
Do you share this belief? Post below. Is this a new theory to you or have you heard it before? It is related to the length of the arm. Now, it's an interesting thing. If we come all the way forward to the Elizabethan age and we look at George Silver, and I know George Silver is a, a contentious uh, source and not everyone's a fan of it, but he does actually say the way to measure the length of your perfect sword blade is to stand like this. So even he in 1599, 1600 is correlating the length of the blade in some way with the length of the left arm. Uh, in his case, he's talking about holding a dagger in the other hand, although he is a big fan of bucklers as well, although he doesn't tell us much what to do with them. But the important and simplistic thing here is that the thing in this hand, the weapon hand, relates to the length of your defensive implement hand in some way. But of course, not all shields are held like this. So first of all, we have um, obviously strapped shields. Now strapped shields tend to be held closer to the body, which changes some things. And you'll notice, we've talked about the Norman shield before, um, shields which are held closer to the body often, not always, but certainly in the case of the Norman shield, have to become longer to defend lower down because you're not defending with the reach of holding your arm out extended. Not to say that they never did that with longer shields, like kite shields and pavises. In fact, with pavises they did. Uh, but nevertheless, there seems to be a correlation between how the shield is mounted on your arm or held on or in your arm and the length and shape of it. If we come to Roman shields, um, it gets a bit more complicated um, because this is a boss grip shield. However, they are big and they are heavy. Incidentally, the hoplite shield as well, the, the famous kind of Greek dome shield, they are also really heavy. Now, if you've got a really big, heavy shield like this, yes, you can lift it out here and you can strike with it and do all sorts of other things, but I can tell you, oh, that is heavy, okay? So generally speaking, because of the shape, but mainly the weight of this, it is tended to be held close to the body. And in fact, if we look at representations of gladiators or indeed Roman soldiers from the period, they are usually shown with the shield held, usually with the bottom sort of outwards, but usually held relatively close to the body because you can't really hold it in, other, in any other way. Now, let's come back to sword length how does this relate well i've already mentioned the fact that if someone's holding let's grab the buckler this time if someone's holding a buckler out here then you i'll grab a different sword this time you kind of need a, a sword that is able to strike past that thing and still hit the person yeah sometimes you don't hit the thing and sometimes you, you don't have to necessarily outreach it because you've maneuvered in uh, terms of parrying one of their blows and you hit with a repost and you move inwards there are other ways of getting there many ways of skinning a cat but fundamentally, the reach that you can defend with this is related to the reach that you can reach past the other person's similar shield. So it wouldn't be much use if you've got a shield you can hold out here. Or I won't say it won't be much use, and I'll come back to Bronze Age swords in a second. But if you've got a short sword, you are always going to have a problem getting past the person's defensive guard or ward if they're holding a shield out at arm's length. Now, in the Bronze Age, they had to, and they had to deal with that, and that tells us something about Bronze Age sword use, but we'll come back to that in a second. Now, you might be thinking, okay, well, what about the, the Roman sword, the gladius? I don't have a gladius to hand, so I'll grab this because it's about the same size as a large um, sort of uh, Hispaniensis or maybe a Mainz gladius. Um, that's a different situation because the shield's not held out at harm's length. Because it's held close to here, the, gla uh, the gladiator, or in fact the legionary, had to require, had to rely to a certain extent on their armour, <laughs> because while the shield offers amazing protection, weapons can come over at close range and still reach you behind it. So if you look at the shape of the helmet, the coolest with the neck plates, or you look at the various types of body armour um, with additional shoulder defences that they were wearing, it's very clear from the training that we've done with Roman equipment practice Roman equipment, that stabbing over the top of the shield is really, um, stabbing around the sides of it is really, really important. So, but you can still do that with a short sword. Now you might say, so why did the Romans switch to a Spartha, a longer bladed sword later on? Well, interestingly, it's absolutely evident that the time that they really started like en masse switching to longer bladed swords was the same period that they switched to boss gripped smaller shields, usually oval, um, probably influenced by their Germanic and other uh, kind of auxiliary troops. 
but they did start using larger, flatter boss grip shields that would be held in a different way to the large scutum. And indeed in that case, because of the reach of the arm, again, the ability to get down to a leg or get to a head past or around the person's shield is dictated by having a certain reach with the blade. So it makes perfect sense that at the same time they switched to these shields, they also switched to these sorts of swords in the late Roman period, and of course into the migration era, and that's what led to a lot of the weapons, <coughs> arms and armour that we see in the early medieval period. So swords and shields are inextricably connected. Now, here's the problem of the Bronze Age. Let's go back to the Bronze Age. So fundamentally in the Bronze Age, we have largely speaking got relatively short swords. That's not to say there wasn't variation. There were, of course, shorter bronze swords than this, and there were certainly some that were somewhat longer than this. However, there is a basic problem when we reconstructing uh, Bronze Age combat, because if we look at the shields, there's actually quite a lot of variety, and we don't really know universally what type of shields were being used by these. It does appear that some of the shields that were being used were quite oblong, not like a scutum exactly, probably flatter, probably boss gripped, not strapped. Uh, but nevertheless, they might have been held a bit like this. And in that case, it does seem that the logic of these sorts of swords that is a bit like a gladius, used with uh, the sort of pre-Roman types of well, the Bronze Age shields that were being used in places like Britain and Gaul uh, and Scandinavia and, and so on, those large shields, in fact, would obey the same rules that I just explained for using this size sword and this type of shield that you have to hold fairly close to the body. And we do... We do see some large shields shown in Bronze Age um, sort of art, but additionally we also find them archaeologically. And if you look at something like, um, even something like the Battersea shield, which is obviously not necessarily a functional shield, but it is a, nevertheless an oblong shield, which might tell us something about some of the indigenous shield shapes that we used in Britain at the same time as these swords, possibly. Um, different period, but anyway, possibly. But we do, in fact, uh, have some more evidence for shields and interestingly some of the other evidence for shields used with these were actually more like targes but boss gripped almost certainly so they were smaller and round now in that case you've got a problem because defensively speaking with a shield that you can hold out at arm's length against a short sword is great great protection okay generally speaking if we're fighting with sword and buckler okay the two the, i would say the three main things you spend most of your time defending okay when you're fighting sword and buckler so say 15th century combination is the head the leg and the buckler arm okay they seem to be the three easiest things to hit in sword and buckler um, the head can be sniped over here and if you can create an opening somewhere else to then come to the head the legs you can reach down here obviously you can't necessarily easily directly defend the legs with the buckler you have to just slip the leg and very often slipping or defending the leg in the same tempo as striking at the person's head and the buckler arm if you get the alignment of the buckler someone out you can sometimes expose the buckler arm and it's a lot closer to the opponent than your body is so it's easier for them to hit it now Interestingly, if we come to, if we extrapolate that to Bronze Age combat, we've got an issue. Because if we're holding a shield out at arm's length, and our arm is long, our arm is longer than our, than our actual sword blade, then we can't very easily reach a person's head, we can't really reach their leg, um, we can't as easily reach the buckler arm, in this case, because it's a big shield. So it actually leaves a great big question about Bronze Age sword and shield combat. Now, I have to mention at this point, of course, we get fixated on swords on this channel and just generally. And of course, the usual weapon used with a shield is actually a spear. <laughs> so maybe we're overthinking this. And maybe the fact is that most of the people owning and wearing and using these Bronze Age swords, well, they also had a bronze tipped spear and that was their primary weapon, much like the Greek hoplite. And it is worth pointing out that the Greek hoplite used a large round shield quite close to the body usually. Uh, but with the way it's held, it's, it sort of has a, um, it's sort of strapped to the arm, but it's a bit further away than a, a scutum normally would be. Um, and they had swords, uh, the Xephos, which was essentially very like an iron version of this. So um, they, they had the sword as a backup, but their primary weapon was always the spear. So maybe the answer is right there. Maybe the answer is that in Bronze Age combat, we don't see necessarily such a tight relationship between the length of the blade and the length of shield. 
because the spear was so important. But you could say that for the Anglo-Saxon Viking era as well. But here's my, here's my, I, I would say my strongest theory. The fact is that you can't make a longer bronze blade. So I suspect in the Bronze Age, uh, when they were using swords like this, and possibly shields functionally similar to this, although made of leather, when they were using these two things together, fundamentally, they were probably far stronger in defense than in offense, if that makes sense, because it's very difficult to reach the targets on the opponent using this type of short sword when they're using this type of shield. So they were kind of hobbled by later periods, uh, compared to later, later periods. So quite simply, if you put a Bronze Age sword and shield person against a Viking era sword and shield person, my money would always be on the Viking era one because they've got a longer blade. And you can't mechanically really do that with bronze. Okay, bronze blades are great for lots of things and when they're in this size and shape, they work really well, but you cannot really make them longer in the way that you can make a steel tempered blade longer. Um, quite simply, you can reach further with a piece of steel without it, without compromising its strength than you can with bronze. So what do you think? These are obviously my rambling uh, theories that I've been mulling over for a while with a glass of port. Um, but my, but my idea is, is that number one, definitely sword blade length is related to the type of shield and how you hold it. Potentially also group tactics and how you fight as a, as a formation and things like this as well. But, but fundamentally the, the shield and the sword designs are correlate. But for the Bronze Age, we have a little bit of a problem because these swords are rather short. And I actually suspect, and I know people disagree with this, I actually suspect that these smaller shields that might have been used by skirmishers and people throwing javelins and stuff, I actually suspect that in the Bronze Age it makes sense if the majority of people using these swords actually were using large hide shields like this, because this type of sword makes sense with a large shield like this that can protect more of you and it makes sense to be able to get past it because you don't know, need as much reach to do so as you do with later longer blade swords. What do you think? Crazy theory, complete nonsense. I'd be interested to see your comments down below. Anyway, thanks a lot for watching. I am, of course, Matt Easton. I will continue to be, and I'll see you back on the channel really soon. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.